Shalom. I'm going to do a few lessons on the small and easily confusable words so we can sort out the meanings of them. You can still get a font chart if you want one. We're going to start with this letter pair, Aleph, Lamed, which has a few meanings depending upon the vowels. I know it's confusing if you are in a text that has no vowels and you say, well, how are you supposed to know which one it is? And you can tell by the context. We have some similar problems in English, so it's not bizarre. This is just a language that may be foreign for you. So the first of this group has the tsere, the two dots, under the aleph. It's pronounced L. And you are certainly familiar with this from several terms. The first term is, for example, El Shaddai, Genesis 17:9. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, Yehovah appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So El Shaddai here is translated as Almighty God. Another word you're familiar with that has the El in it is Immanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Immanuel. Im, which is a pair we'll eventually cover, it means with. Anu means us or we. El, God. Immanuel, God with us. So here are some examples where this word El is used in Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. El can be any sort of God. Psalm 29, 1, a psalm of David. Give unto Jehovah, O ye mighty, give unto Jehovah glory and strength. So the phrase in Hebrew there is actually B'nai Elim, sons of the mighty, but it's not referring to Yehovah because the verse says, give unto Yehovah. Who is supposed to give? The mighty are supposed to give unto Yehovah glory and strength. It can be used for any pagan gods, for example, Exodus 15, 11, who is like unto thee, Yehovah, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Now, you are familiar with the term Elohim, no doubt. It comes from this root also. But sometimes they're even used in the same sentence. So, for example, in Deuteronomy 10:17, For Yehovah, your God, there it says Elohim, is God Elohim, of gods, also Elohim, of the small g gods, a Lord of lords, a great God, our God, and there it's, it uses just the word El, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. The next word we're going to look at of these two letters, Aleph Lamed, has the three dots under it, a segol, it's pronounced El. And in general, even in speaking, you're not going to be able to hear the difference between El, God, and El, which means it's a preposition to. But again, it'll depend on context. Prepositions are very tricky when you're going from language to language. They just, they don't always match up perfectly. Uh, L is very widely used in a variety of circumstances. It can mean to, like in the direction of a place. Genesis 1.9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Let the dry land appear, and it was so. Here we have two examples in Genesis 4, 8. And Cain talked with Abel, or to Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, the same preposition, El, his brother, and slew him. Some other examples of various uses. Exodus 29, 12. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar, with thy finger, and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. Same preposition, L. Second Samuel 2.23 Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him under, L, the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, 
and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to El, the place where Asahel fell down and died, stood still. Now this preposition El, meaning to in a direction or a place, can also be spelt with just the Lamed, in which case the Lamed will be attached to the word. And all the infinitives use this Lamed. You can't use the two words El for the infinitives. Infinitives, to go, to be, to have. The infinitives are the same as they are in English. The last word, and this is very unusual to have three different vowels to go under the same pair of letters, uh, is the patach, and this will be al. Al is a negation particle particularly used with requests or commands. Don't do that. Genesis 13.8. And Abraham said to Lot, let there be no, in other words, let not there be all strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren. In Genesis twenty two twelve, and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do, or do not do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Can we see how all these are related? If we look at the paleo pictographs, we see the Aleph is the strong one, the ox, and the Lamed is the shepherd's crook or the ox goad. And so the idea of Aleph Lamed has to do with what you attach yourself to, the strong one. El, the God, he's the one that I'm going to attach myself to, and he's the strong one, I'm going to let him lead me. Where is he going to lead me to someplace? If he wants me not to do something, he'll say, I'll not, nah, please don't. I know you probably know that there's a word for don't, no, which is low. They're just used in slightly different circumstances, almost interchangeable, but not quite. So with respect to this idea of strength, we see a word, ail. Genesis 22:13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Uh, very interesting. He told Isaac God would provide a lamb, but instead they get a ram. So what do you think about that? In Genesis 12:6. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Sometimes this is translated as plain of Moreh, but it is Elon Moreh, the strong tree of the place of Moreh. Here in Exodus 15:27, we see the name of a place, Elim, which is the plural of Ail. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. So the word for palm trees is tamarim. It is a word for date trees. But the concept of there being strong trees in the place is reflected in the name of Elim. Now here is another combination of letters. You have the ayin lamid, and that is always written with a patach underneath it, and it's pronounced al. So it sounds like the last of our Aleph Lamed, Al, the negative particle. But this is strictly a preposition, again, a little bit widely used. Usually it means on. Genesis 6.1 And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. It has to do with something, things being up and over. We're going to see that. Genesis 8.1 And God remembered Noah and every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, above the earth, on the earth, and the waters were assuaged. From this concept, we have the idea of El Elyon, we talked about before. Elyon is going to be the highest thing. Genesis fourteen eighteen, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, the El of El Elyon is God. Elyon is the Most High. In a different context, Genesis forty seventeen, And in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, 
and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head, the baker in jail with Joseph. Here's a word, aliyah, which has to do with things that are up. First Kings 17, 19. And he said to her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft. Sometimes this is just translated like a room, but the idea is a room is up, possibly next to the roof where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. It's always an upper chamber. Uh, Nehemiah 30, 31. After him repaired Melchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Netinims and of the merchants over against the gate of Mifchad and to the going up of the corner. It's a place where it goes up. Now, of course, you know this word aliyah. It means to immigrate to Israel. And this is a concept, Torah concept, no matter where you are in the world. If you go to the land of Israel, you go up. You can be coming off Mount Everest and you still always go up to Israel. So the verb to go up is also related. Genesis 2, 6. And there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Genesis 8, 20. And Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So the word for offering and the word for burnt offering both come from this verb, ola, olot, the burnt offerings. Why? Because the smoke all goes up. The whole offering goes up in smoke to the heavens. Another word with a very related me meaning is ale, which means a leaf. Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Some place it's also translated branches. Nehemiah 3.18 And that they should publish and proclaim in their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount, and fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths, as it is written. Nehemiah commending the people to... Honor Sukkot. We also have this word Ya'el, which is a mountain goat. Psalm 104.18, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. And sometimes you can see these mountain goats are way up high and they got their skinny little feet on just some tiny little ledge, but they're well known for climbing high, high, high. There's also a woman named Ya'el, Judges 4.17 Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Ya'el, the wife of Heber the Kenite. And there was peace between Yavin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Another related idea of something being on something is the word ol, which means yoke. Genesis 27.40 And by thy sword thou shalt live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. So that by the sword, that is the preposition al, ayin lamed, and from off is a, a double preposition, me al, from over his neck. The word yoke. So this is a physical implement which is used, it goes over the neck of the animal, or if there's two animals yoked together. Lamentations 3.27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth, that he learn how to work in a disciplined way. First Kings 12.11. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. A very foolish Rehoboam. I also wanted to bring this to you. This is from the Talmud, from the section Pirkei Avot, talking about the yoke of Torah. So this is an ancient concept that if one submits himself to Torah, his life will be a certain way. When Yeshua came and talked about take my yoke, he was very specifically comparing the way he taught the people to live to the way that the rabbis taught the people to live. The yoke of Torah is beyond what's written in Torah, what's written in even Tanakh. It is the oral Torah, the additions of the rabbis. So this is what is written. Whoever takes upon himself the yoke of the Torah, they remove from him the yoke of government 
in the yoke of worldly concern, and whoever breaks off the yoke of Torah, they place on him the yoke of government and the yoke of worldly concerns. And this remains true if you will live under the yoke of, of the Torah and of Yeshua's teaching, then that will be your highest direction, your highest authority. If you can be obedient with a full heart towards Torah, what does it say? The things of the world grow vaguely dim. It's not that you don't have to keep the laws of your country, but when they are in conflict with Torah, you know where your allegiance will lie. So now we see the name of the Israeli airline, and it combines these two letter groups. L, going to, Al, something that's above. It's a very clever name, but the man who gave it that name did not make it up. It comes from a scripture in Hosea. And you can see I've highlighted in the Hebrew El Al. And this is how it's translated, to El Al the Most High. So that rang in his ear, I guess. His name was David Remez. And since the founding of the airline in 1948, it has been called El Al, to what's ever up. I pray this has been edifying to you. Until next time, Tasimit Ha'inayim Al-Hashamayim. Keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.